Good evening to the people living in this region and good morning to those tuning in from the other side of the world. Today, we are back with yet another installment of our Mentoring Talk series, an initiative that aims to change the way we perceive failure. Since October 2016, we have been regularly inviting numerous esteemed speakers from different walks of life and from all over the world to share with us the hurdles they, uh, they have faced throughout their successful careers. Despite the obstacles that the pandemic brought with it and the current dire conditions in Lebanon, we persisted. Although we started hosting our distinguished speakers online via WebEx instead of in person here at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, the message remains unchanged. Explore, dream, discover. Let us welcome today's distinguished speaker, Professor Kathy Milkman, a pioneering scientist and a champion of strategic behavioral change. Professor Milkman is a professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on the ways economics and psychology could be used to transform behavior. She is a former president of the International Society for Judgment and Decision Making. Professor Milkman is an award-winning scholar and teacher. She has collaborated with or advised dozens of organizations on how to spur positive change, including Google, the White House, the American Red Cross, and Walmart. An advocate of long-lasting behavioral change Professor Milkman's research is frequently covered by major media outlets such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and NPR. Her self-help book, How to Change, The Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be, is a New York Times bestseller. Her podcast, Choiceology with Kathy Milkman, explores key lessons about decision-making from a behavioral economics perspective. Professor Milkman earned her bachelor's degree from Princeton University and her PhD from Harvard University. In 2021, Professor Milkman was named one of the world's top 50 management thinkers by Thinkers 50. She was also ranked one of the world's top 40 business school professors under 40 by poets and quants. Today's mentoring talk will have a slightly different flavor. Our speaker would like her talk to be more of a fireside chat and is looking forward to answering as many questions as possible. Quoting her, quoting her book, making hard things seem fun is a much better strategy than making hard things seem important. Kathy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction and for having me. And I am really excited to have a conversation today uh, about change, resilience, and any questions that are on your mind at all. Um, I realize there's quite a lot going on in the world at the moment, and, and that may give rise to different directions than we would usually take in a conversation like this. Um, on a very lighthearted note, I actually did bring one video that I, I quite love. And then I, I wanna start by sharing. And I'm not gonna give much context. I'll explain why I love sharing this with audiences in a moment, but actually those opening remarks helped set the stage to some extent. So let's see if I can successfully pull this up. I'm optimistic we did a little test. Here we go.
All right. Hopefully everyone was able to see that all right. And I'm coming back on video. You're able to see it very well. <laughs> Excellent. I love it when technology works. Um, I love that video because um, it illustrates a path we rarely take when we're thinking about how to make change, but one that turns out to be really important. And it's a path that um, my colleagues and friends, Ayel at Fishbach of the University of Chicago and Caitlin Woolley of Cornell University in the US have shown um, is undervalued. So in general, when people have a tough goal that they want to achieve, the path that they try to take is the most efficient one. They look for the most efficient and effective route to get to their goal, whether it's you know studying late nights or uh, exercising on the most painful exercise equipment. You know whatever the goal is, it's that direct route that they're looking for. But a small subset of people take a different approach, which is to try to actually find a path that will help them reach their goal that may not be quite as direct, but that they'll enjoy, that they'll find fun along the way. And what's really interesting is that those people have the formula right. If people are actually instead encouraged to pursue goals in ways that they find fun, as opposed to effective, they end up getting to the goal at a higher rate. And the reason is if we don't enjoy the process of achieving our goals, we quit at a much higher rate than we would if we were uh, having a good time. And we don't, we don't recognize this about ourselves, we think, you know, Nike's got the formula, just do it, just, you know, grin and bear it, grit through, um, push hard and you will succeed. Uh, but in reality, the way that we're wired is that we crave instant gratification and we don't persist nearly as long on things that are difficult as on things that we find enjoyable. And so trying to actually construct your goal pursuit in ways that will allow you to enjoy the process, enjoy the journey, is much more impactful in the long run because most of our goals require persistence rather than that one-time effort that will get you a little further if you're going in the most efficient route possible. So that's one of my favorite lessons, both in life and from the science of behavior change, I thought it was a good um, place to start. But I also want to sort of step back because I know this is a, a mentoring talk and that's a, that's a bit of mentoring advice, but I'll give you a tiny bit of background on my personal journey. And uh, I'm really excited to then sort of turn to fireside chat style and, and answer questions. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm, I'm sorry to be joining you from my home in Philadelphia rather than in person. And I have visited the beautiful AUB campus in Be uh, Beirut in the past. My very closest friend from childhood um, is Lebanese and uh, she grew up in Washington, D.C., but um, you know, Palestinian Lebanese, and she lived in Beirut for many years, and I got to visit her there. Her um, grandfather was a professor at AUB, as was her aunt. This is a very special place to me, uh, and I feel lucky to be joining you and, and wish it could be live. Uh, I, I hope you are all enjoying your time there. Um, my background, I grew up in Washington, D.C., as I just mentioned, uh, uh, and was very lucky to have parents who were extremely committed to education and made that a top priority. And so I always loved books. I loved, um, you know, scholarship. And but I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And in college, I was just searching, just like most college students are, trying to figure out what would really click for me. Uh, and I had a very formative experience when I was required to write a senior thesis to graduate. Uh, I went to Princeton and this was a requirement for everyone. I know in some universities it's an honors requirement, but in our case, every single student had to do it. And so it was this stepping stone that I was thinking about starting freshman year, wondering what I would do um, in order to graduate and get my degree. I didn't really think of it as something that would be a source of joy in and of itself, but I thought it was this requirement and I, I wanted to do it well. Um, and what I ended up studying in college was not what I expected. I thought I liked math, I liked numbers. I thought maybe I'd be an economics student, which of course I now study economics. But at the time uh, I took microeconomics, an introductory class, I actually hated it. I, I didn't like the subject at all. I thought um, it had these very unsophisticated models of human behavior that basically said like people are perfect optimizing machines, they'll always figure out the costs and benefits and solve every problem perfectly. And I was looking around at my college roommates and I don't know about you, but we certainly weren't optimizing on many dimensions. You know, our room was a mess. There were lots of people who were missing deadlines. And this is, mind you, at a top university. Uh, and, and these are the top students. We were, you know, having relationship challenges. Just things were not optimal. So 
economics seemed sort of silly to me. And I decided to actually switch and become an engineer. I did summer school in order to meet the requirements because at least there I could use math to do optimization over dimensions I believe were objective and real. So I majored in engineering and specifically in something called operations research and financial engineering. It's a, a field that basically is a combination of statistics and optimization and computer science. And then I minored in American studies. And the reason I did that, I will admit, is that I loved reading um, American stories, fiction. Uh, and that was sort of like the left side of my brain to give it what it needed. So I would like take these engineering classes, but I'd also always have a novel to read. Um, so here comes the part where I had this journey that changed my life a bit. I had to combine those two topics to do the senior thesis. And um, I had to figure out something that would use statistics and American fiction, essentially. And I came up with the idea to do a statistical analysis of New Yorker short stories that were written over a decade. So the New Yorker is this you know, uh, wonderful periodical that, that publishes one to two short stories in every issue and it comes out weekly. And um, they really define the, what is great fiction uh, in, in the United States is, is sort of what the taste of the New Yorker editors says is great fiction. Many of the great novelists of our era started as writing a New Yorker short story and appearing in their pages. So um, think Jhumpa Lahiri, um, uh, Philip Roth, um, uh, Haruki Murakami. Um, I'm sure I'm missing lots of important names that you would think of, but lots and lots of famous writers, that's, that's how they start. So I thought it'd be really interesting if I could quantify the type of fiction that was being published over a decade. And I looked at a couple of questions. One, I looked at whether or not the backgrounds of the authors of this fiction resembled the characters they wrote about. And I did this because in all of my American studies classes, we would spend time learning about the authors of the fiction and then um, trying to figure out whether or not you know, we could gain insight into the, the story and its meaning from that biographical information about its author. And I thought, you know, how autobiographical is fiction? Like how relevant is it to spend that time? So I wanted to look and see, do authors write about characters who resemble them in terms of the, the location where their um, story is set, in terms of the demographics of the protagonist and so on. And the answer was yes, uh, authors write fiction that's extremely autobiographical. It's set in locations disproportionately where they've lived. Um, you know, they write about characters who share their race and gender at a disproportionate rate. Um, although interestingly, those who are um, women and minorities step out of their own identity groups and write about members of other identity groups more often than members of majority groups, um, which I thought was really interesting too. And I also looked at how shifts in the editorial staff changed the nature of the fiction and found that they did dramatically sh reshape the kinds of stories that were being published. You could see statistical uh, distinctions in what kinds of stories are being published in the pages when there's a an editorial shift. So those were the things I studied and it was this amazing experience. It was life changing. I loved collecting the data. I fell in love with getting to be the first person in the world who would open an Excel spreadsheet filled with these numbers and figure out, is it true? Do women write about men more than men write about women? Is it true that, uh, you know, people write about the, the regions where they've lived or or is fiction really about fantasy? Uh, and it was so exciting to do this and to get to talk about it. And other people were really interested, which also surprised me. Um, the day I graduated from college, actually, the New York Times ran a major article about my thesis. Uh, I couldn't believe anyone cared, but but people thought that was, it was interesting too. So um, that really changed my life because I realized I loved collecting data, loved answering questions with data. Um, I loved answering social science questions with data and that other people were interested in the things that I was interested in, I could do this well. So I went to graduate school, became an academic, the rest is sort of history. Um, the only other thing I will mention that was sort of a pivot point in my career and then get to the Q&A and that might resonate with some of you is I, I pretty quickly, once I went to graduate school, figured out I love data, I, I pretty quickly honed in on some things I found interesting. I loved, I loved answering questions about people. I was a social scientist, as you can see from that first project. I wanted to understand how people function, how they make decisions about things like um, not only uh, who their protagonists will be, but you know what movies to rent online, what groceries to purchase, whether to get vaccinated, um, whether or not to save for retirement. Um, so I was interested in decision-making. But once I, I, and I was decent at it, so I got a 
job at a wonderful university right out of graduate school. The big pivot point for me after that realization I wanted to be an academic and do social science research that might be relevant to some of you was um, listening to a presentation at, over at our medical school at the University of Pennsylvania, where I have now a secondary appointment. But I sort of wandered in. There was an interesting group over there doing research on medical decision making. And I was interested in decision making broadly. So I thought, why not go hang out with some smart people doing interesting work? And this graph went up on a slide that was really important and meaningful to me. And that graph showed the percentage of premature deaths in the United States that were caused by different things. Uh, and it, you know, had all sorts of stuff on this graph, right? Cause uh, deaths, premature deaths caused by accidents, premature deaths caused by the environment, premature deaths caused by genetics. Um, and there's also a wedge in the graph that showed premature deaths, what fraction is caused by decisions that people make, daily decisions that could be changed about things like eating, physical activity, alcohol consumption, cigarette smoking, um, vehicle safety, and what blew my mind and changed my life is that the wedge showing the fraction of premature deaths in, in my country that were due to behaviors we could change, it was 40%. And it was bigger than any other source. And I had no idea what an enormous impact these daily decisions that I was studying, I'll say sort of casually, could have on such an incredibly important outcome. And that was a moment when I pivoted my career again to be much more laser focused on trying to understand how can we change behaviors for good? Uh, how can we help people make lasting changes to their health, to their finances, to their educational outcomes that will um, really set them up for success? Because I realized the potential impact and meaning of that work was so much larger than I had appreciated. And that gave me the ability to really pivot from sort of scratching intellectual itches and putting out data that it was fun to talk about to doing something where I felt I could make a positive impact on the world. And I think um, as you're thinking about what you want to do with your lives, looking for things that you find fun, uh, for things where you add, you know, marginal value, like you're good at this. Um, you can ask questions that are interesting, but also where there's real meaning and a real opportunity for impact. I think that's sort of the, the dream. And I feel very lucky um, that I found what, what was a good fit for me. So I actually talked a little longer than I meant to there, but hopefully it wasn't too boring. Hopefully I didn't drown on, drone on too much. I'm really excited to switch to fireside chat mode. Thank you so much. And uh, we already have a long list of questions. So I'm gonna start with the first question. Uh, this is from Nader Naufal, biology senior student at AUB. You talked earlier about people changing um, and their ability to change. Are there any pre-existing determinants that will tell us whether or not some people are more likely to change? Is it something about genetics or the kind of childhood you had? Any research that tells us about who is more likely to change? Yeah, it's a really wonderful question. Um, I will say, and th I think this is a very optimistic bit of news that um, when we look at research, when, when we do research projects where we're trying to help people make a change in their lives around you know, whatever goal they've set out to pursue, we're always looking, there's been, I apologize if you hear sirens in the background, I think there's a fire down the street from me and keep hearing them. Um, there's been lots of attempts in our work to say, you know, does age matter? You know, how old you are? Or does um, where you live matter? Does your gender matter? Um, does your educational level matter? What are the various things, traits that we could describe, use to describe you? Do they, do any of them correlate with how easy it is to change? And pretty systematically, we don't see strong correlates, um, which I think is really encouraging. People always assume, you know, if you're older, it'll be harder to change. Or if you have a certain background, it might be harder, easier to change in. And generally we see that the tools we're putting out there to try to help people make change in their lives are not very dependent on traits, but rather um, work work pretty broadly for different kinds of people. So I think that's actually really encouraging, though it may, you know, it's always nice to have like a diagnosis, like I am the type who has the ability or doesn't. Um, it's certainly harder to change, I will say, when financial resources are strained, when health resources are strained, anytime we have um, less in the way of opportunity, change is harder, which makes, sense. It's one of the many reasons that it's so important to uh, to try to create a more level playing field and give more people the opportunity to, to achieve their goals. But when it comes to 
things within you, characteristics of the self that are not outside of you. Um, there, to, uh, you know, my read of what we have found is that there aren't super strong predictors, uh, and that's good news. Anyone can do it. Looking for that. The second question is from Rain Zankar, also a biology senior student at AUB. Uh, your book begins with this really interesting story about something that happened at Google. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and why that's so central to some of the work that you did over the next few years? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and actually, the fact that it was there, there I can point to these moments um, when my career took a different turn because of something that happened is, is sort of very meta, as you will see when I tell this story. So um, I visited Google about a decade ago and I was giving a presentation to some of their senior human resource managers. I mean, people who were responsible for improving um, policies around uh, you know, hiring, retention and employee development and benefits. Uh, so I gave this presentation about different scientific studies we'd run that showed ways you could nudge employees towards better, healthier behaviors. How do we get people to exercise more, to save more for retirement, et cetera? And I got this fantastic question at the end of my presentation from one of the lead human resource managers at Google um, named Prasad. Prasad raised his hand and he said, hey, Katie, you know, completely sold on the idea that we should be using these tools from behavioral science to nudge better decisions among our employees. That makes lots of sense. But um, I'm wondering if there is an ideal time to nudge change. Is there, are there moments when we should be particularly communicating with our staff, our, um, all the folks who work here about the different benefits programs we have or trying to nudge them towards change? And I thought, wow, that is such a fantastic question because just intuitively, obviously there are moments, if you think about your own life, when you're much more open to encouragement or much more open to making a change, it feels like the time is right. And others, when you're completely disinterested, you're in the flow of things, there's no chance that you're gonna make a life change. I thought it was a great question because research really hadn't looked at that. Uh, and the first idea that came to mind actually when I thought about it was, well, we know that New Year's is a moment when around the world, uh, lots of people choose to make a change, right? We all have this practice of setting New Year's resolutions. And I wondered what it was about that moment that made it so fortuitous for uh, for considering change. So came back to my office in Philadelphia. I was out in California for the meeting at Google. Started talking with my amazing PhD student, Heng Chen Dai, who's now a professor at University of California at Los Angeles, and also Jason Reese, who's a a uh, uh, senior fellow at Wharton, and we all started talking about what is it about New Year's? What makes that moment special? What's our intuition about moments when change would be more likely, more generally? And what we realized and learned as we were talking and reading uh, about this question that really captured all of our imaginations is that the way that we think about time, the way that we think about our lives is really not linear. So if you look at, there's a whole research stream on what's called autobiographical memory, the way that we reflect on the years we've already had. And the way we group our memories, it, again, it's not linear. Instead, we put our life in chapters, like we're characters in a book. And we think about um, prominent chapter breaks, right? Oh, there were the, uh, the years in Beirut, the years at AUV, then there were year, the years, you know, maybe in Cairo or uh, the years when I was working at this employer. And, and you sort of create these chapter breaks around those different parts of your life. And every time that you experience a chapter break, it feels like a new beginning and like a fresh start. And that's part of what the magic seems to be of New Year's. At New Year's, you feel like you have a new beginning, you turn the page, it's a new chapter, and you can say, you know, okay, the old me had these goals last year and the old me didn't quit smoking or didn't really get my grades uh, to be quite as excellent as I had hoped they would be. That was the old me. And this is the new me and the new me is gonna be different because you have this sense that there's this, this separation, this peel, uh, this, this fracturing of your identity. And that gives you the sense of optimism about what you can achieve in this new beginning. 
So we started documenting this, this idea that there are new beginnings in our lives and that they're broader than just the start of a new year. So they um, arise at the start of every new week. In fact, we get a little miniature new beginning, um, the start of a new season, the celebration of a birthday, um, the start of a new month, the celebration of holidays that we associate with new beginnings. And those are different in different religions, right? You can think about Easter as one big fresh start moment for many people around the world, but there are others depending again on um, your belief system and your religion. And those moments um, and moves can do this too. They give us the sense of a fresh start. So we've shown this now in, in lots of data sets. Um, we see that people visit the gym more frequently at the start of a new week, month, year, following holidays, following school breaks, following birthdays. They create goals on a popular goal setting website online more frequently at these particular moments. Um, and there are goals about everything, not just health and wellness, but about student goal, student related goals, you know, achieving more in school, um, environmental goals, financial goals, they all show these spikes where people look um, to create change more at these fresh start moments. And we've also found that we can encourage change more effectively at these moments. So if, for instance, we point out to you an opportunity that you might not have been paying attention to, to make a change, we say, hey, did you know that um, March 20th is the first day of spring, it's coming up. And do you wanna start making a change right around then? Cause it's a fresh start moment. Uh, that leads to a lot more change than if we say, hey, did you know the third Thursday in March is coming up and it's you know a great fresh start moment. You can make start making a change. Those are literally the same date, but um, one of them labeling it, pointing out that it's a fresh start is really motivating to people. Uh, we can get people to save 20 to 30% more for retirement. If we start, if we invite them to start saving in the future and just note that the future date when they could start saving falls on a birthday or falls on the first day of spring rather than literally making the same offer but without alluding to those special dates so there's something sort of magical that we discovered about these fresh starts and our ability to become more optimistic about our capacity at those points in time uh, and it all started with a moment <laughs> when i got a great question at google thanks for the question amazing thank you uh, this question is from Ghada al faqih she is a psychology junior student at AUB. Could you please give us examples of the tools that could be used to change behavior? Yeah, let me tell you about one in particular. I can give you lots of examples, but let me tell you about one of my favorites that sort of aligns with what I started, where I started with that um, make it fun video uh, and how important it is to make it fun. And this is a tool that um, we can all use to try to actually make what normally feels like an uphill battle when we wanna create change into a downhill one, into something we look forward to. And I'm going to talk about my own experience with it, although lots of other people have used it in very different ways, but I'll start at the beginning and then I'll get to the research. Okay, so um, when I was a graduate student, I was in an engineering and business PhD program taking tough classes for me, you know, lots of um, problem sets, long days. Uh, I was tired at the end of each day of coursework, but I needed to come home and get my homework done. Um, I also really knew that in order to stay healthy and happy, it was important for me to get exercise. But at the end of a long day of classes, all I wanted to do was just curl up on my couch when I got home and, you know, binge watch lowbrow TV shows or, uh, you know, read trashy novels. That was sort of my escape. And it's all I had the energy for. I just couldn't bring myself to do my work or to get the exercise I knew I needed. No, neither of those things were really happening. And then I had an idea and the idea was, okay, I need to motivate myself to stop procrastinating and to also um, work out. And I thought, what if I try a new rule where I only let myself uh, indulge in that entertainment that I'm craving when I'm spending time at the gym? And I, the idea was it would solve two problems at once that um, first it would lead me to get to the gym because I want to find out what happens next in my latest you know, novel or, or TV show. Um, and two, it would reduce the procrastination I did at home because uh, I would only be allowed to get that, that entertainment fix when I was on the elliptical. So I started doing this and everything changed for me. I'd come home at the end of the day, tired from classes, but I'd be excited to put on my workout clothes, head to the gym, get my latest fix of you know Alex Cross, Harry Potter, uh, I, I did it with audio novels because I found that there was too much sensory input from the TV shows, but 
many, many people prefer TV shows. I'll just say, um, I, I love the time I spent there. It would fly by. It wasn't painful. I used to dread going to the gym, but I didn't even notice because I was, you know, working out while I was in the middle of this story. And then when my workout was over, I'd come home, I'd had my entertainment fix. I was energized and I was totally ready to focus on my work. There was no procrastinating happening after that. Uh, so I call this temptation bundling. I've since studied it in multiple experiments and shown that it's a very useful tool. Not only uh, I've shown that it can help people exercise. If you bundle a temptation with workouts, like, you know, audiobooks or, um, uh, binge watching TV, things that are guilty pleasures. If you restrict your access to them, to the gym, you get more exercise in and you're happier. Uh, but also some of my collaborators have looked at this in other contexts that for instance, one study looked at whether or not, um, temptation bundling with study habits could be useful, letting students listen to music, um, you know, eat snacks, uh, use, um, colorful markers to, while doing math problem sets in, in high schools. Teachers were very nervous that would reduce performance, but it actually improved persistence because students found studying more fun. And so they stuck to it. So if we can find ways to combine temptations, you only let yourself pick up your favorite coffee drink on your way to the library to hit the books. You only let yourself listen to your favorite uh, podcast while you're doing household chores. Um, you only get to watch your favorite TV show when you're on the, the treadmill at the gym or going for a run around town while listening to an audiobook. Whatever it is, whatever the combination is that works for you, if you link something that you find tempting with what would normally feel like a chore and not be enjoyable in the moment, you can turn that chore into a source of pleasure to something that you won't procrastinate on doing that you'll look forward to. And that can be really a valuable tool for creating change. So there's my one, uh, one tool that I'll offer, but there's more of course, where that came from. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Mary Ann Shaheen. She is a chemistry student. What is it about a human being um, that you think is central to your work and the way you have gone about thinking about your research? Um, I think the most central insight, and I didn't really sort of talk about my field much when I was talking about how I landed where I am, but I think the most central insight in the field I'm in, which is behavioral science or behavioral economics, as it's sometimes called, is that human beings are fundamentally flawed in the way that we make judgments that we are not perfect. So I told you how turned off I was by my first class in economics, and it, it, it was grounded in this original model, sort of neoclassical economic model of humans as perfect optimal decision-making machines. And Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky in the 1970s are two very famous psychologists who came along and sort of said, wait a minute, <laughs> that's not right. Uh, in fact, there are systematic and predictable ways that people make mistakes in decisions and that we can start to understand what those are, unpack the systematic and predictable errors people make. And um, that could be very useful to have a better model of decision making. We do things like procrastinate. Uh, we, you know, postpone or delay uh, doing work that will be challenging. Um, and that's due to something called present bias, the tendency to overvalue the instant gratification we'll get from something and undervalue the long-term rewards it will offer. Uh, we overweight losses relative to gains. For instance, we find it much more vo motivating to avoid a loss than to, to get an equivalent gain. Um, there are all sorts of irregularities in the way that we make decisions that have been documented since the 1970s to the present day that paint a much more complete picture of human nature. And what that creates is sort of an opportunity for the kind of work that I do, which is to say, if we recognize that people are systematically and predictably imperfect in their judgments, which I think that's now fairly well accepted. Danny Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for his work on this in 2002. Um, Richard Thaler won another Nobel Prize in 2017 for the work he did that really built on that foundational research um, and expanded it. Uh, once we recognize those systematic irregularities and, and predictable ways that people can make mistakes, in comes an opportunity to try to improve judgment. Because if we say, okay, look, there, we're fallible and here are the ways that we're fallible that are systematic and predictable, then we can start trying to line up solutions and say, what will make people better decision makers? What will help them save more adequately for retirement, um, exercise more regularly, quit smoking when they wanna quit smoking but struggle. Uh, and so that I think is the, the fundamental element of human nature that lets all this work come to be. Thank you. 
And this question is from Lara Swade, uh, biology senior student. What did you learn from your academic mentor, Harvard Business School professor Max uh, Bezerman? Bezerman? I know or some of you read the book, and I am honored that you did. Um, thank you for taking the time to read How to Change, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so this is maybe my favorite chapter of the book. I, I get to reflect on the many lessons I learned from my amazing mentor. So Max Bazerman is a psychologist at Harvard Business School, and he, you know, he's famous for his research on negotiations and conflict resolution more generally and, and brilliant, but actually maybe even more famous at this point for being an incredible, incredibly successful mentor in our field. Uh, dozens and dozens of his students have gone on to be professors at leading universities. And particularly, um, he's shown an incredible ability to mentor successful female students, uh, where in a field where maybe 15 to 20 percent of tenured professors at top universities are women in business academia, something like 80 percent of his former students are uh, our female academics who are tenured and senior women. So some huge proportion of all of the senior women at business schools are former Max Bazerman students. So what's the secret sauce? That's sort of a question that started to interest me when I was first an assistant professor trying to mentor and train younger students. Like, what is he doing that's so successful? And I actually, I started by asking him that question, which is always a funny thing to do. And I'm in a field where we acknowledge that people don't really have the ability to always say what are their limits and sources of success. So it's sort of funny to, but anyway, my first, I sent him an email and I said, okay, Max, tell me your secret sauce. Cause I've got to start mentoring people. You've got a secret sauce. What is it? Well, first of all, being a very humble person, he uh, immediately was like, well, I don't have a secret sauce. Uh, I really don't. You know, he said, like, the students that find me are amazing. It's them, not me. I really don't have anything to do with it. Um, and then he gave me a few little tips as well. He's like, I don't know, here's some things that I think I do decently. And I was, you know, writing down all my notes. I was like, this, it can't be right. Of course, he has a secret sauce, you know. I'll take his tips. I'll, I'll reflect on what he did for me. You know, he introduced me to lots of important people. He would take, you know, when someone would come from a, a visiting professor from another school, he'd often have a dinner party and all of his students would get to meet them. So he made these great network connections and he had these regular weekly meetings with his whole research group and we'd all come together and give feedback on things. And he was very responsive on email. Okay, I can do all that. But what I realized as I looked sort of deeper at his model and the way he'd been a great mentor is he'd done all those things for sure. And those are all excellent things as a mentor, being responsive, helping build the network, you know, um, creating community. Those are really important things. But I noticed that a lot of mentors did those things and still didn't churn out successful students at, at the rate Max did. <laughs> um, and I started to reflect on another aspect of his mentoring strategy philosophy that he hadn't explicitly pointed to, but that I realized I had benefited from just immensely. And that was uh, basically treating his mentees, his students, as if we were his family, um, giving us the benefit of the doubt in essentially all cases, um, making it completely clear that he thought we were without question destined to succeed. He used to literally write insurance contracts. This is, it sounds like a joke, but it's not. For his students who were on the job market, who were nervous about getting a job, he'd say, look, you're gonna get a job at a top university. I guarantee it. And if you're really nervous about it, I'll write you an insurance contract. You know, here's what, you know, I'll guarantee that you get this income level next year. You just have to give me $5,000 up front. I mean, it was sort of a joke. No one ever took him up on it, but he was very serious. He would do it. And he was conveying his complete and utter confidence that we would succeed. Um, another thing he did to convey his complete and utter confidence that I, in hindsight, realized was really important is that um, when he had senior students in his research group, he had them mentor junior students on projects. So rather than him always being the one who's offering guidance and advice and saying like, yeah, oh, here's what's right, here's what's wrong, the senior students would often be the ones who were spending time with junior students. He, he's like, I trust you so much that you become the mentor to the younger people and you help them with the projects and come to me when you get stuck. But like, you know, you're going to, he sort of had this um, train, you, you train the next generation below you model. Um, both of those things I now think were really key ingredients in his success. And here's why. There's all this research showing um, that when you believe you will succeed, you have better results, right? Think about the placebo effect. 
somebody gives you a sugar pill who you trust and they tell you it's going to make you better. Well, in 60 to 90% of diseases, there are actual benefits from taking sugar pills because you expect success. And so it follows. Um, it literally changes your physiology. There's wonderful research by Aliyah Crum at Stanford University on some of the ways that 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 belief, that expectation can change your physical response to medication um, or to you know drinking a, a milkshake that you believe has a certain number of calories. Uh, depending on whether it's a lot or a little, your your gut reacts differently. Your body changes its response. Max led his students to believe we would succeed. And then when we ch faced challenges and adversity, because he'd given us that optimism, we responded to them really differently. We responded to them with an expectation that good things would come and we should keep persevering. And I think that was so important. Um, and I also think the mentoring of other students was important. And I've done research on this since led by Lauren Eskris Winkler at Northwestern University. She had this insight that when you are put in the position of role model and mentor to others, it boosts your confidence, uh, your belief in your own abilities. It leads you to come up with insights that you might not otherwise about what will work for someone like you, because now you have to give advice. And then once you've said to someone, oh, you should do this, you should do that, you're going to feel hypocritical if you don't do the same things yourself. Um, so between that confidence boost and that introspection and the desire to avoid hypocrisy, becoming an advice giver, a mentor, a role model really helps you achieve more. So Max gave us both of these things in spades. And I, I think that was the secret sauce. And I will say that in my own mentoring, I use those strategies along with all the other sort of best practices, right? The networks, the, you know, the social interaction, um, the quick responsiveness. I aim for those things too, but I think more importantly, perhaps, or more uniquely, um, making sure students when they face challenges that instead of sort of shaking my head and being like, yeah, that's tough. This is going to be a hard one that I'm constantly giving them that reinforcement. Look, you know, you've got what it takes. You wouldn't be here if you didn't, I wouldn't be working with you. I, I chose to mentor you because I know you've got it and okay, sure. There's a, we've had a setback, but you can get through this. This is good enough. You are good enough. Um, and also putting students in the position of mentor to younger students so they can start doing coaching and introspecting that I know they're capable of and, and growing in that way. So I hope that helps answer your question. And um, I highly ad advise you to advise others in order to grow your own capacity. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Selina Bujaudi. What has your experience as a tennis player? taught you about human behavior? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> so, okay. And, um, as you, so the, those of you who've read my book already know this and those of you who haven't will be like, what? Um, so I didn't mention earlier that, that a big part of my childhood was spent on the tennis court. Um, I was a very serious and competitive tennis player. Um, and my summers were spent, you know, traveling to tournaments, all around the country. And I played um, college tennis, which is very competitive in the US. So I spent probably, I don't know, three or four hours a day on the tennis court from age 10 to age 20, uh, which, you know, that's a lot. <laughs> that's formative, it's meaningful. And I learned a lot of lessons um, in that time, just as you would from anything, you're devoting enormous time. You know, I learned lessons about how practice improves outcomes, right? And how, um, setback, you know, when you have a setback, the most important thing to do is, you know, give yourself a little space, but then get back out there and try again. Cause you, you know, you're only gonna have more setbacks if you don't, if you don't get out there and practice quickly again and, and figure out how to recover from that. Um, I learned a lot about community. I had a tight knit group of coaches. My, in my book, I actually open with the story of Andre Agassi, who's one of my favorite tennis players of all time. It was a story I learned in my own career, but it was much more fun to illustrate through his life experiences. And I talk about um, a challenge he faced. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Agassi, but I, I talk about a challenge he faced in the early 1990s in his career. So he's one of the greats of all time. If you're not familiar with like 1990s, 2000, circa 2000 tennis outcomes in the world, but one of the greatest players of all time, uh, but he had a rocky start. Uh, and it's funny because he was a phenom when he was a teenager, people expected great things from him, but, and he eventually did become number one in the world. He spent over a hundred weeks at that level, won 
roughly a dozen grand slams, the biggest tournaments there are, but, but it, it was bumpy. So in the early 1990s, he was facing this real challenge where he'd been a phenom. Everyone had expected him to be a star and all these other junior players. Can you get the microphone closer? I I think when you, thank you. Is that better? Oh, I also touched it and turned it down. So I'm turning it up. That'll help. There we go. Okay. Uh, So in the nineties, he's having this bad moment because all these other people he's grown up with are actually doing better than he is, even though he was the one who supposedly had all the raw talent. I mean, he's doing okay. He's like ranked 30th in the world, but his peers who he had grown up beating and expecting to outshine are number one, number two, number three. And he's just not cutting it at the level he expected to his coach quits on him unceremoniously. He reads about it in the newspaper and you know, he's really trying to figure out how is he going to turn it around? How is he going to make a change? How can he become what he's destined to be? And his longtime friend, friend from high school, who's now his manager at this point says, I want you to have dinner with this guy named Brad Gilbert. And Brad Gilbert turns out to be another player who Agassi knows really well. They've he's beaten him about half the time they've met. He's ranked roughly the same, but he's really a lot older than Agassi. He's getting to the point where he's going to need to retire soon. And he's just written a best-selling book that's called Winning Ugly. And the premise of this book that Brad Gilbert wrote is that um, there's a lot of mental stuff in behind tennis. It's not just how good you are. It's how you play the game, essentially, you know, and how well you outsmart your opponent. Uh, and so Agassi agrees to this dinner, even though he's not a huge fan of Brad Gilbert. Um, Agassi's always been known for being, like, really flashy. Um, he wears, like wild clothes under the court. He likes to look good in everything he does. And uh, Gilbert is not like that, right? Winning ugly is sort of the opposite of that is this guy's philosophy. He's like gritty. He hangs in there longer than he should in matches and he doesn't win on gorgeous shots. He wins by outsmarting his opponent. So they have this fateful dinner um, and Agassi's talking to Brad Gilbert and Brad says, look, I just have to say to you, if I had, you know, your talent, I'd be number one in the world. And Agassi's like taken aback. It's like, what do you mean? He's like, you're, you're playing the game all wrong. Brad Gilbert says to Agassi, you know, the most important thing to do is set the odds up in your favor out there on the court. You have to figure out what is the weakness of your opponent and tailor your game to be strategic, to understand, like, I'm going to exploit that weakness to my advantage. And you go out on the court, he says to Agassi, and you try to hit a winner off every shot. You try to win every match playing your own game. You don't adjust for who your opponent is at all. You don't tailor, you don't strategize. You just go out there with your big fancy shots and you're so good that you're still winning a lot of matches anyway. But if you just thought about what are the weaknesses that I'm up against and how can I exacerbate them? How can I beat this player um, by changing my game and matching my game to them? You would be number one in the world. And Agassi's like, I've never really thought about this. I've always been playing this one game. You know, I have this great forehand. I have these great shots. I've been just exploiting them, but he's completely intrigued. So he takes on Brad Gilbert as his coach and sort of the rest is basically history. But the the, the glory story is like he goes from unranked playing this uh, the U.S. Open a few months later. He's had a terrible year. He'd lost his coach and he becomes the first unseated player not expected to perform in the top 32 or the top 16 at the and he wins the whole thing and he wins it with this new strategy of tailoring his game to his opponent and he goes on as i mentioned earlier to be ranked number one in the world for over 100 weeks you know there were more bumps in his career he has a divorce and there's some moments when he's down but really that that was a moment when things clicked and a lot came into focus and i, I feel like i learned that lesson too on the tennis court differently, but about how critically important it is to use strategy to your advantage rather than just play the same game all the time. And in my career, that has become a huge theme. And it's sort of the key theme of my book. When I talk about behavior change and how to succeed at creating change, one of the things I've noticed is that so many companies, so many individuals, they they have like a one size fits all approach. They hear about a strategy, you know, temptation bundling, which we talked about earlier, or, you know, set big audacious goals, whatever hooks their imagination. And they say, I'm going to apply this everywhere, right? I, you know, I've got a hammer, everything I see is a nail. And 
what I've found is that it really depends on what the barrier is that you're up against when you're trying to create change, what the best strategy will be. Um, the strategy of trying to make it fun to pursue change is so effective when the barriers to change are um, that your long-term goals are not aligned with what's enjoyable in the short run. And so you might procrastinate or um, you know, refuse to actually engage in the thing that will produce this delayed gratification. That's when trying to figure out how to make it fun has, can just work magic. But if that's not the barrier, if it's something else like forgetting or habits or a lack of confidence, then you're not going to get very far with temptation bundling. And you need to actually look at the science of behavior change, look at the tools that have been tested and try to match the right solution to the barrier you face. So tennis taught me about that strategy and I get to tell the Agassiz story, which is wonderful, but I learned it on the court myself and lots of others too. But if I, you know, go on and on, we won't have time for other questions. So hopefully that gives you a sense. I think in, maybe let me just back up for like one second, just say in anything you pursue, where you pursue it seriously, whether it's a foreign language, a sport, um, you know, a community service activity, there are lessons to be learned in that space that will be portable to what you choose to do with your career and to what you're doing with your studies, whether it's about how to be resilient in the face of challenge um, and you learn how, what works for you in that context, um, whether it's about the importance of strategy um, or your team, the people you surround yourself with, just be looking for those connections rather than thinking of these as separate orbits, because there's always a lot to learn whenever you're striving uh, in life in any domain that can be taken from one setting to another. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, this question is uh, from Clemence Jaber. She's a business uh, student. How to convince someone that doesn't want to change or believe in change that change is innate and beneficial? Yeah, it's a great question. And I will just say um, something that I've, I think about a lot and I've been thinking about even more in the last year and a half in that um, the research center I co-direct at the University of Pennsylvania has been very involved in trying to think about how we can use behavioral science to aid with pandemic response. And a lot of that involves trying to get people to make changes to whether or not they're masking, vaccinating, social distancing, um, when they might not want to, and they might not believe that they really need to, maybe because of misinformation or disinformation. Um, it's a hard question. So, of course, you know, one strategy, and this is like a tried and true one, is change the incentives, right? If you, uh, if you have the ability to do so, and you can change the cost-benefit calculus, that can change behavior reliably, because now something that didn't make sense uh, well, oh, now it's costing me a lot. And speaking of which, I said, maybe we'll even talk about what's going on in the Ukraine. If you look at what's going on right now on the global um, stage, that's an approach that's being taken is let's change the incentives, right? Let's cut off um, access to capital and, and change the incentives for making. And that happens. It can happen on a global stage. Let's change a country's incentives. It can also happen at an individual level when we think about something like, um, pay, you know, uh, Let's talk about vaccine mandates. You, your employer says you cannot come to work unless you get this vaccine. Well, now that changes the cost benefit analysis for me in a serious way. I'm going to have to leave this employer, go find another job, or I can't go to restaurants um, without being vaccinated or masked. Well, that's going to change the equation for me. So that's that's a if you have the ability to pull those strings, changing the incentives is a really useful way to encourage change, probably the most useful. But sometimes you don't have the ability to play with incentives or you don't feel comfortable doing it. Maybe you feel like there's an ethical barrier you're going to cross. And in those cases, there are still ways that you can encourage change. Um, one of the most powerful, I think, is um, that we can change people's beliefs about the value of making a change, not only through economic incentives, but through social information. So when, for instance, let me just give you an example that may resonate. You're all college students, and this is in the book as well, but I love it. When you're randomly assigned a college roommate who had better grades um, as a freshman, um, you end up having better grades. So why is that, right? Why would that happen? Well, the logic and the research suggests that when you are spending time around someone else, their habits start to rub off on you and their values start to rub off on you. So you notice this person's staying in on Friday nights and studying, 
you're thinking, well, that's a normal thing to do. I guess like some people who are staying in on Friday nights and studying, maybe I should as well. Uh, on the flip side, they're saying not a serious student. They're going out and partying on Friday nights. You're like, oh, I should be out partying on Friday nights. What am I doing sitting in here with my textbooks? So the people around you shape your decisions. And there's various ways that we can use that to change beliefs and expectations in ourselves and in others. Um, in ourselves, uh, we have an opportunity to seek out um, friends and colleagues who we see have traits that we admire and would like to build more on ourselves and to actually deliberately try to emulate some of the things we see them doing and even ask them, what are your strategies for getting straight A's? Like, tell me about where you study and when you studied, use flashcards. We can be really deliberate about copying and pasting others. But also when we want to encourage change in someone else, we can use those same social norms. For instance, by just describing to people the majority of your neighbors use less energy than you do, or the majority of people are reusing their towels. The majority of people um, in your neighborhood are voting in this election. When you describe the behaviors of others, it becomes more attractive for people to follow the crowd. So if the majority of people are doing something, or even I should say, if an increasing minority, so there's a trend, people like to follow trends. They can see where that trend is leading. When we describe those norms, that can change behavior in important ways as well. Because now you believe, oh, if other people like me are doing it, if it's popular, it must be doable for me too. And it must be the right thing to do. So I would say incentives and norms are two really powerful ways to um, change behavior among those who might not be eager to change themselves. Thank you so much to learn from you. So this question is from Juwan Haddad, psychology uh, senior student. Do the tools that you have suggested to change a person's behavior make the behavior change easy or easier? Easier. It's a great question. I don't think change is almost ever easy, unfortunately, because, um, well, because we have these biases that are ingrained. We have these tendencies, for instance, to be, as I said before, present bias, to always reach for the thing that's more instantly gratifying over the thing that gives us longer term rewards to um, look for the path of least resistance in life, which by the way, it's something I write about, you know, I call it laziness, but I actually think it's a positive trait, right? Like we love computers and, and algorithms that are lazy. They find like the, the most efficient solution. That is, that is the ideal, but we're the same way. So we're always looking for shortcuts. And um, because we tend to follow that easier path and change tends to be harder than just sticking to what you're up to, um, even when we use all the tools and tricks, it's still not easy. It's still a little bit of an uphill battle to make a shift in your perspective or your way of living. So I don't, I, and I do think there's a disservice done when people describe change as easy because then when someone tries it and they experience some of the setbacks that are inevitable, uh, they're going to feel like there's something wrong with them or they're doing it wrong, or this isn't for me. And, in, and the reality is that anything new is a bit of a shock to the system and right. It takes some getting used to, and it takes some work. And so understanding that it's not going to come easy, that there will be setbacks. That's just part of the part of the experience um, is important. And there's wonderful work by Carol Dweck of Stanford University on what she calls growth mindset, showing just how important it is to have this perspective of recognizing that um, when you experience a failure, which is truly inevitable in any journey where you're trying to accomplish anything, there will be setbacks. If we recognize that failure is not diagnostic of our capacity, but rather an opportunity to learn and grow, we have much better outcomes. So she contrasts two kinds of mindsets we can have when we encounter failure. One is a fixed mindset, which would say like, oh, it, anything that goes wrong is diagnostic because I, I have a fixed capacity. If I fail a test or you know um, mess up a relationship, that's just telling me something fundamental about me. I'm just not that smart. I'm just not that good at interpersonal relationships. So it's that's a fixed mindset. If you have a growth mindset, you recognize something that is, by the way, empirically true that pretty much any capacity um, in the world, you can grow it, uh, whether it's intelligence, um, athleticism, uh, you know, musical talent, whatever you, whatever capacity you seek, interpersonal skills, 
It's all growable with practice and effort. Everything can be improved. And if you have that growth mindset, if that's the way you go into life, and then you have a bad relationship outcome or you get a bad test, instead of seeing that failure, that setback as diagnostic and saying, oh, I'm just not that smart. I'm just not that capable. You can approach it instead with a growth mindset and say, you know what? I am still growing. I still have things to learn. This was not a success on my path. It was not a check mark. It was an X, but you know what? Let me look at what I can learn from that. So I'll do better next time. And people who have that growth mindset have much, much better outcomes. So I would just say, um, change is not easy. Um, and, but using these tools can make it easier and then applying a growth mindset can be really valuable. And, and again, recognizing change isn't easy. It's a process, but that you can grow and you can get better at it and you can learn these skills. That's going to set you up for more success. Thank you. Can we have still like 10 minutes till uh, quarter past the hour? Is that okay? That's fine with me. I blocked this much time. Thank you. So we're Thank good. You. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this question is from Hussein Hijazi. How and where do you find inspiration? What dreams and goals inspired you to succeed? Um, I love that question. I think, uh, so first of all, I find inspiration from other people, right? The people who are in my community and outside of it, the people who, um, who I read about, whose work I um, admire, have always been an inspiration to see, you know, look at these other stars who are achieving these incredible outcomes with their research. I wanna learn more and grow to be more like that. And maybe, you know, maybe someday I can make contributions along the lines of what these folks have made. So I'm sort of always looking who, who is it out there who's doing what I'm doing, but better um, and doing it uh, in a way that's having a bigger impact and a and um, that I'm excited to try to grow into. So that's that's one source of inspiration. It's just sort of trying to have a role model. Uh, and it's easy to find because there's so many inspiring people in the world. And then trying to understand what would it look like to grow into that kind of role. Um, so that's one. That's like a meta answer. And I think we'll. And then and then specifically in my line of work, I'm always looking for inspiration and ideas that feel like they could be value add to the world that I can study. And in that, the answer is actually also a very social answer. Mo many things I will say in life, I find that sort of doing them together is better. And and looking for um, communities is where all the great things happen. So I'm sort of there's a little echo there. But not only am I sort of looking for role models as inspiration, but I also have always tried in doing research to, to um, reach out and try to work with people who um, I, I find help me think about ideas in exciting new ways and stretch me. I like to work with people across different disciplines. I've, I've always been sort of itchy to learn from other fields where there's more distance between what I know and what that other person knows and more opportunity therefore to to like have a giant insight leap. So my PhD is technically in computer science and business, but I now work with economists, psychologists, computer scientists, um, doctors. I have paper with a lawyer, a paper with an English professor, statisticians, um, and I'm sure I'm leaving someone out, sociologists. No not chemists. No chemists. I've, I've never published with a chemist, but maybe we can fix that. But it's so much fun to be talking across disciplines because people see the world in different ways. They see things that you might miss. And then you just, there's so much more you can learn and absorb. So that would be another place I look for inspiration is like across fields at people who are doing really interesting things, but in a way I would never think to do them. Going and having those, starting those conversations and trying to start co collaborations, I found is hugely productive and exciting because it's fun to be doing work that feels like a stretch as opposed to work where it's like, I'm just turning the crank on something I already know how to do. So other people, I guess, is my answer to both of those questions for inspiration. Thank you. Uh, this question is uh, from Abdel Jalil Hijaj. Uh, any all time favorite books that have specially stuck with you and or shaped your thinking over the years? Yes, I mean, my all time favorite book without a doubt is a book called Nudge um by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein and uh it's a book about how it, you know it talks about all the behavioral biases that lead us astray and it talks about and it introduces this idea that they call um choice architecture 
which is that anytime we're making a decision, the environment where we're making it, whether that's, um, you know, a physical environment like the piano stairs uh, or a uh, like a form we're filling out or a room we're in where we're having a conversation, the physical environment, the, sh the, the space where we're making that decision is going to shape it in ways we may, may not appreciate, right? So if you see piano stairs, they're calling to you, that's gonna shape your decision in a powerful way. If you're in a cafeteria and you are, the first thing you encounter is much more likely to end up on your tray than the last thing. And so once we recognize that choice architecture shapes our decisions, we can start thinking wisely about how to design environments to shape decisions in positive ways that will help individuals achieve their full potential. So it's my favorite book. Uh, it's wonderful. It really stimulated a huge amount of my work and sort of my philosophy on using behavioral science for good. Uh, there are three questions that are related. So I, I think you can address them together. Uh, okay. The questions are coming from Mia Aboud, from Lean Hijazi, and from Kistel Jabour. Why did you decide to share your knowledge by writing a book? What is special about the title of that book, How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be? And then, uh, even as the author of the book, How to Change, are there any habits or behaviors that you have not been able to start or break? And uh, if you can summarize your book in uh, two or three sentences to the audience, these are the three questions from the three of them. Okay, let's see if I can do it all. Uh, I'll try. <laughs> I, I thought they are related, no? Yes, they are. They're all book questions. Yeah, okay. So my book, uh, How to Change, is, I okay, um, I chose to write it because, as I told you, I had this moment that sort of changed the course of my life where I saw this graph and I learned how big the impact of our daily decisions could be. And I pivoted my research to trying to focus pretty um, narrowly on uh, understanding what are the things we can do, what are the tools we can give the world as scientists to improve um, positive um, behavior change, make it more possible for people to achieve their goals in health, in finance and their financial goals and their educational goals. So I was narrowly focused on that in my research. And I always felt like I was doing this because I wanted to be able to create a body of knowledge that really could have an impact. And, and when I felt like I knew enough that I could give it to people in a digestible format to help change their lives and help them change the lives of others, then it was obvious that it was time to write a book because that's a really useful way, I think, to convey knowledge to a large audience um, that can help them. So that motivated the book, the How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be title came um, through pain and suffering and trying many titles on for size. Um, but this one felt true to the mission of my work and what the book could deliver on. It's really about trying to figure out, you know, you need to know where you're starting, for how to get from where you are in order to you know, shape the strategies that will help you get to where you want to be. And sort of it's choosing it's choosing the right tools from your toolkit. And that's what the message of the book really is. The Agassiz story opens it. And each chapter is structured to talk about a specific internal barrier to change that many of us struggle with and what the best solutions are from science and research that can be useful in overcoming that barrier, whether it's present bias or impulsivity, procrastination, forgetting, um, habits and, and um, laziness uh, or confidence um, or even um, you know, conformity that we tend to do what others around us are doing. That can be both a barrier and a solution. So each chapter is structured to give, help you get from one place where you might be having a challenge to where you want to be. So the title, uh, I hope is an honest account of what the book delivers. And it's, you know, it's very scientific in that, uh, I'm a scientist, so there's, there's no speculation. It's always sort of, if I'm sharing a, a story or an anecdote, it's based on, uh, a scientific study that proved this tool can be useful. Um, yeah, so hopefully that, I hope I hit all of the points that you, that you asked me to. Yeah, uh, this question is from Lil Nal Taif. Uh, what do we know about fresh starts and how can the impact of these starts on the way we perceive the passage of time help us change? Yeah, so this is going back to the research that was spurred by my visit to Google when I was asked, um, what, you know, are there moments when people are particularly motivated to change and um, finding that these new beginnings are moments when people are particularly motivated to change is something my collaborators and I called the fresh start effect. 
So I think actually maybe the most useful thing to, to say about it that I haven't said already is that fresh starts are these incredibly motivating moments when, you know, you make a move, you begin a new um, semester, you start a new job, you're more open to change because it feels like a new beginning. And so you can capitalize on that to try to think like, what, what in my environment should I change? What of the tools of behavior change that science offers should I try to adopt in order to create a change in a positive direction that will last? So we can do that. But I also want to mention a downside of fresh starts, which it's worth noting. Um, and my student Heng Shen Dai has pointed out that when, while fresh starts are really useful when things are not going terribly well, right? When we have a goal we haven't been able to achieve, getting that clean slate and that fresh start and that new beginning, it motivates us to try again. So that's great, but they're not so helpful when things are going well. So if you are on a roll, if you've got, if you've built a habit that you're really proud of, but then you move to a new community or you move to a new job or you start a new semester with a new set of classes, actually you're at more risk of disruption due to a fresh start uh, than you would be if things, if you maintain continuity. And so being aware of that is really important too. So you can take steps to try to avoid being disrupted. Think about what are you going to do to avoid the obstacles that are about to get in your way? How will you retain your workout routine or your study habits or, um, you know, your healthy eating, whatever, whatever it is that's going well, how will you avoid seeing it disrupted when you make a change and being aware of what's coming? Um, that's really important, I think, to, to keep in mind too. Um, we still have many questions. So what about five more minutes? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So this question is from Mahmoud al Hajj. Uh, he's a biology junior student and uh, he would like to become a doctor. So he's a pre-med student. Uh, he's asking to uh, tell us a little bit what drives you, what motivates you to do what you do, and is change always a personal decision? What is the role of an organization in the change process? Two great questions. Okay. Um, honestly, I'm really motivated by two things, I think, in my work. Um, one is the, the, this, there's this higher purpose that I feel driven by in, in doing the work that I'm doing. And that has really helped me enjoy and care, um, each day when I wake up and feel like there's a reason that I'm getting up and doing this work. It's because there's a potential to help people live longer, happier lives. Um, if they can achieve their goals at a higher rate because of the science, then more people will, you know, be around to meet their grandchildren and um, will, you know, be able to afford uh, to live comfortably and, uh, and to, you know, achieve their dreams um, because they've gotten the educational outcomes that they wanted to get and, and are able to take advantage of opportunities. So the, the meaning and purpose of my work is really important. But then I would also say the other thing is the day to day is fun. And that again, aligns with what I was saying earlier, the day to day is fun. And that's partly because I've learned to work with people who inspire me and who I really like. So when I, I have a lot of freedom as an academic to choose who I collaborate with on my scientific projects. It's something I love. It's a lot like being an entrepreneur and I have chosen to work repeatedly with people who. Um, whose company is a source of pleasure, who I um, find it fun to spend time with, to talk about ideas with. And that means that um, it's not a drag to get up in the morning and go to my desk. I don't just have the higher purpose, but I have something I look forward to in so many of my meetings, so many of the activities I'm doing. Um, I really love teaching as well. I find that tremendously invigorating. Um, so all of these, I, I like doing a podcast I do, I liked writing the book. I choose work where I can achieve that higher order goal, but in a way that I find fun. Um, and that, that keeps me going and motivated. And then I dropped the second line of thought. There was another question in there and I lost it. Forgetting is a chapter in my book, by the way, and I do it a lot. Uh, so he's asking, uh, is change always a personal decision? What is the role of an organization in the change process? That was yeah, the second. Thank you. I'm sorry, I, I lost um, that thread. Yes, um, change is not always just an individual decision. Often organizations are trying to propel us towards positive change 
because of uh, hopefully if they're doing it for, you know, non nefarious reasons for shared goals, right? A lot of the time it's, uh, there's an alignment between an organization's goals and your goals. Think about your university. They, they want you to succeed and graduate and go on to get great jobs. That will be good for the university, but it'll also be good for you. Uh, and, and likewise, once you have an employer, they want you to um, be productive and successful and, uh, you know, move up the, the chain and stay in the organization making progress. And you want that too, right? So there, whenever there's an alignment between these goals or a public health organization that wants you to live a long and healthy life and not be coming to the hospital regularly for emergencies, um, and you want that too. So whenever there are these alignments, I think that's a, an, a great opportunity for organizations to forge change and help people by pointing to fresh start moments, nudging people towards programming that can be helpful, teaching us about temptation bundling, sending us reminders. So, you know, we've only putting us in the position of mentors, just as my advisor, Max Bazerman, found ways to support me and help me achieve my goals. He was achieving his career goals too, of, of being a successful teacher and mentor and researcher. Um, so we can, we can use those tools for ourselves as individuals, but organizations can also propel us towards change by putting us with, you know, surrounding us with, with role models, putting us in the position of mentors, teaching us about temptation bundling, nudging us towards fresh starts. So it can happen at both levels. And I think that's, um, when the best outcomes happen, there's this symbiosis between the individual and an organization that they're spending time with, uh, and both are pushing in, in this positive direction. Um, the last two questions, I'm going to ask them together. Okay. So this is from Joanne Zreib. She's a biology senior student. And she's asking, what does your research suggest about where belief can be powerful? And how should we think about its role in behavioral change? And the other one is from Diane Saab. She's thanking you a lot for the inspiring talk. And uh, she's asking, how can understanding of our internal obstacles drive us to change? Okay, great questions. Um, let me start with uh, belief. So I, I've mentioned earlier how important mindset is and having a growth mindset. That's one way in which belief matters. If you believe that you can grow and change as opposed to your fixed, um, that kind of belief has big implications for the way you interpret failure and whether you learn from it or treat it as diagnostic and, and sort of stagnate. Um, and, and believing in yourself also means being motivated. If you, if you have confidence that you can achieve something, then, then you're more likely to put in effort towards achieving. If you think I'm incapable of this, then you'll give up. So I think beliefs are really important. The placebo effect, as I mentioned earlier, is really powerful and it matters not only in medicine, but in our own achievement. If we can, um, find ways to, to believe more in ourselves by surrounding ourselves with, with those who support us, um, surrounding ourselves with peers who show us what's possible, then we get better outcomes pretty reliably. Um, and then, uh, I guess on the other, on the other point, I would say, okay, wait, uh, I've already lost that thread too. Give me the second question separately. So I don't bust them. I, I, I thought I was helping by combining them. Sorry about that. No, no, I'm uh, sorry that I have no, asking. I have no short term memory. It's, there's a reason there's a whole chapter about this topic in my book. <laughs> How can, uh, uh, this is Diane Saab asking, how can our understanding of our own internal obstacles drive us to change? Yes. Well, you've just witnessed repeatedly my lack of long, uh, of memory for more than one thing. So understanding that about myself, I will just say, I structure my life with that knowledge, right? When I, when I have a conversation with someone and I say, I'll do something, I don't just expect myself to remember it. You know, it goes in the calendar or I ask, can you send me a follow-up email? I think, um, this is sort of like a fundamental point of know thyself of, of all my research of my book. And it couldn't be more important to the way I live my own life. Once you understand what your limits are and what your capabilities are, you can structure your environment to help you succeed so that you're, you know, plugging the gaps. You're not expecting things of yourself that aren't possible. You don't expect yourself to work 150 hours a week um, and then get good outcomes because that's literally not possible. You don't expect yourself to remember things if you have a bad short-term memory, it's not gonna turn out well. So what are the systems you can put in place to plug the gaps? Um, like setting up temptation bundling, if you know that you're not, you know, it's gonna feel like a chore to achieve your goal if you don't find a way to change the nature of it and make it fun and you're gonna quit if you don't make it fun. So it's really all about understanding what you're up against in order to plug those holes. Uh, and again, forgetting is a big one for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, 
In uh, previous uh, years, whenever I uh, hosted before the COVID, whenever I had the chance to host a speaker for a mentoring talk or other initiatives of our transformative education and authors of books, we arranged for book signing. And uh, we always, uh, I always arranged for a copy of the book to be autographed by the uh, author and I donated to uh, AUB Jaffet Library or AUB Science Library, depending on the speaker. So if you don't mind, I'm going to order two copies of your book and I'll be mailing you the books so that if you don't mind, you autograph one to the uh, AUB students. So that will be donated to um, AUB uh, Jaffet Library and the other one is for me so that I will <laughs> enjoy reading it. Um, I have be my here, pleasure. Uh, I actually, I have here a book uh, by uh, autographed by Nobel laureate Sir Fraser Stoddard when he was here uh, in 2018 uh, and he gave a beautiful mentoring talk and uh, also uh, the, Her Excellency Najat Belqasem, um, who was the first woman to be the French uh, Minister of Education. Also, when she was here, she autographed her book and um, we, uh, we donated it to the Jaffet Library. So if it is okay with you, I'll be emailing you uh, as soon as I order the books and I'll mail them to your office or your home, whatever address you give me. And then I will be arranging uh, with uh, AUB how we will go pick them up and then they will deliver them here. And then uh, your book will be here autographed. So anytime you visit here, you can uh, check out your own book from the books. <laughs> Oh, I'm honored. It would be my pleasure and um, I'm honored to be in such esteemed company. So thank you so much for inviting me and for uh, asking for a signature on my book. And this has been really fun. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Everyone's asked such terrific so, questions. Uh, yeah, I want to thank you again for your time. I know how busy you are and uh, we took a little longer than uh, we originally planned for. I want to thank all the attendees. I want to particularly uh, thank the members of my uh, transformative education team who have done uh, quite uh, research on your book and they came up with uh, so many beautiful questions and made uh, this mentoring talk quite unique. Uh, on behalf of everybody here, I would like to thank you and I look forward to hosting you here in person on campus at AUB and maybe to tell us how much it changed from the time you were here years and years ago. I would love that. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. It was lovely to meet you. I hope Thank to see you, you in your person. Time. Thank you for your time. You have a great evening. Bye-bye. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.